We have to reconcile our economic objectives, looking out particularly for people who are living at or beneath the poverty line uh, with these uh, climate objectives, but bearing in mind that climate change is gonna destroy so many livelihoods. So the case for emissions reduction is an economic case. It is a case actually about justice as well and trying to protect as many livelihoods as we can. Good afternoon. I'm Jonathan Capehart, Associate Editor at The Washington Post. Thank you all for joining us here today at the Rockefeller Foundation. And thank you also to those watching online, who I'm assuming are right there. Uh, we kick off This Is Climate, Women Leading the Charge with the current USA, USAID Administrator and the former United States Ambassador to the United Nations, Samantha Power. Administrator Power, welcome. Thank you. Great to be here. Um, let's start big picture. How and in what ways are women disproportionately impacted by climate change? Well, first, let me thank those of you who are putting on uh, this event and just say this is my 10th uh, uh, unga. It's my 10th, no, my 11th unga, 10th unga. Um, and uh, this is the first time I've been at an event like this, which is just taking head on um, a major source of many problems and a major necessity in terms of solutions. So I'd say first, women are, as all marginalized persons, all vulnerable populations tend to be disproportionately affected by climate change. We see it in um, minority communities uh, in this country over and over again. We see it all around the world uh, playing out. Um, if you look at actual casualty rates or death rates in natural, national, natural emergencies, you see women and children bearing the brunt. Um, and you might think, oh, well, that's a biological difference, and maybe they can't outrun the uh, tidal waves or whatever, but it's as much about gender norms and be feeling like you need permission in order to know whether you can leave and being trapped in homes. Um, it's, uh, you know, in general, just actually ha being responsible for so much in terms of the family's welfare um, and you know, not being in a position uh, again to put one's own well welfare uh, very prominently, um, you see it day to day. The vulnerabilities, you know, as water dries up, and you know, I've just been to so many places. I'm sure many of you have as well, where it is just so stark, even from year to year, how different the landscapes are from the ones just ten years ago. But one thing hasn't changed that much, which is the norm that it is women who go collect the water in rural communities. So as water dries up near the community, women have to walk further and further. Uh, and that's, of course, been a uh, terrible um, means by which or, or route by which uh, women have been continually subjected to gender-based violence en route. So the further you go, the less protection you have, the more that those other norms that don't on their face seem to have that much to do with climate change per se, a norm that indicates it's okay to uh, assault or, or attack a, a woman, that norm then intersects and thus you know, means a disparate impact again on, on, on women in that sector as well. So where, where in the world are these issues most acute? Well, it's hard to choose. I, I've, I'll give you just a little bit of a brief tour of my r recent horizon or whatever the backward version of a horizon is. You know, over the last year, uh, I traveled to Pakistan when a third of the country was underwater because of a combination of unprecedented rains and melting glaciers colliding at once and inadequate preparation and infrastructure. Um, and again, it's women often the last to stay uh, to protect 
uh, property or to protect uh, livestock as men go in search of help. I mean, everybody's um, affected in terrible ways. Traveling from there then uh, to northern Kenya and to Somalia to see five straight failed rainy seasons, so the complete opposite of what I had seen in Pakistan, which is just parched land. Um, millions of live livestock uh, died uh, of the drought uh, in the Horn of Africa. Uh, you might think, well, the main effect would be on the pastoralists, which, of course, the people who raid the, raise the, the, uh, the livestock. And sure, you actually saw a big spike in suicides of these men because they, for millennia, had been raising animals, and suddenly their entire herds of goats or camels wipe, wiped out just like that. Um, but when it comes to managing the effects on families and the severe acute malnutrition that young people were left with, particularly kids under five, it was women who had to both deal with despondent husbands, deal with the question of what becomes of sons who had imagined that lifestyle continuing and now had suddenly thinking, how do I possibly give them an alternative life, an alternative vocation? Um, but then also, you know, being in a position to, to try to find food for, for the youngest. So, I mean, again, it hits in different places. I was just, last one I'd offer you was just in Fiji. And of course, for all the Pacific Islands, it's, uh, or almost all of them, it's an existential threat. It's about whole nationalities having to figure out in some number of years ahead where they move to, what they do, like if they can't live in the, in the, the parts of the country and the, or in the, the particular islands that are so... Uh, low, low lying, and um, just small examples with where women out there growing industry. In this instance, met with a, women, a group of women who were growing sea grapes, uh, which, are, by the way, are delicious. I'd never had sea grapes before, um, and they were so proud of their sea grapes. And we, you know, USAID is trying to support them, get a micro uh, loan so that they can build their business, grow their business. But just incidentally, and this is where you know climate change just comes up at every turn. They say, well, the only problem these days is we now have to take our boats further and further out because as the ocean warms, it warms particularly close to the shore. So we have to go further. So we go further to get our sea grapes. That means much longer away from all the other obligations we have as women in the household. Moreover, we use fuel powered boats. So we're putting more emissions out into the air as we go and try to retrieve these sea grapes in order to grow our businesses. So, you know, again, every, everywhere you look, Pacific Islands, Africa, uh, Asia, you know, it's, it's walloping communities. I, and I want to get to, you mentioned microloans, and I want to get to um, the, the aid that USAID, um, USAID gives. But are these issues that you were, we were just talking about, that's a lot of the developing world, but are, is what we're talking about confined to the developing world? No, hardly, but I just happened That's to... That's called a leading question. <laughs> <laughs> we live, I mean, we're, I think, on our 23rd uh, natural disaster here in that, that has cost over a billion dollars in the U.S. right now. Uh, we've experienced our hottest day, week, and month on record, I think, just in the last couple months. Um, for the first time, we had to shut down certain businesses and summer camps and uh, opportunities for young people because of wildfire smoke uh, extending uh, into our lives. And um, again, the disparate impacts, you know, this is a, maybe a small example, but when a kid can't go to camp, it's going to be the working mom by, in most households certainly mine, uh, <laughs> that is going to have to figure out what, you know, it's like a, a version of what happened with COVID. Um, you know, when uh, climate hits, whether in small and fleeting ways that, that have severe health impacts and severe uh, lifestyle impacts, it is going to fall to the multitaskers uh, of the home uh, to manage that. But I mean, the, the also just the financial effects of the damage now being done on what feels like a near daily basis to some part of the United States uh, can't be overstated. It happens just not to be what USAID works on because we do our work uh, overseas. And, and our work, I will say, one of the biggest tensions and challenges that we grapple with is we're given fixed resources and not resources that are not keeping up at all with uh, the development setbacks that climate change is causing at all at all, even though they're growing, our resources are growing, but you just, you can't keep up. But the other problem is not just that, it's that 
so much of our resources go to keeping people alive in emergency circumstances, like those in Libya just over the last week, uh, or those I mentioned in Pakistan or Somalia, and what you wouldn't do to be taking all of that humanitarian assistance and investing it instead in disaster resilient infrastructure or in drought resistant seeds or in those micro loans uh, you know, to small farmers who are actually capable of using their smartphone to anticipate extreme weather events and at least mitigate what those losses are. So that what I've described is kind of the difference between resilience uh, and emergency, you know, relief. And, and we are very weighted as a, as a government and as a donor community writ large toward, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful privilege to try to help people get through the worst moments of their lives. But uh, in doing it that way, which is quite stopgap, you know that you're going to be back at it. And, and that is, you know, extra heartbreaking. Because it used to say we'd say climate shock, but now it's kind of like, is it a shock? when it is a predictable feature of, um, you know, a particular part of a country's um, farming life. Um, and, and so what does that require of us? If the pie were bigger, we would dramatically increase our investments in resilience, which is what we should be doing. Uh, it's hard to not save lives in the interest of saving lives in the longer term. So we are, we are balancing this as best we can, but it is, it's not a fun balancing act. You anticipated the question I was going to ask, jumping off the microloans piece. So I'm going to jump ahead. Um, the relationship between economic development and, and climate change. How closely linked are these issues? And how is uh, USAID addressing them both at the same time? Well, I mean, I'd say we are in or we are moving toward let me say because we have a long way to go um embedding attention to climate change as a design feature of all of our work so one sort of structural maybe wonky example of this is that we have taken our food security and resilience bureau and merged it with our climate uh team and, and so that is where, but the nexus there is quite obvious to people. It's not a perfect overlap, but, but there's tons to be, agriculture is a major source of emissions, so uh, those emissions need to come down. Um, and of course, climate smart agriculture is gonna be the way that we preserve food security or in, increase it in the years ahead. So that's one merger, but in terms of education, it's the number one, I mean, all of us, any of us who have kids, it's the number one thing kids wanna know about is, is not only what's going to happen to to the world that I know, but also what can I do about it? Um, so even thinking about education in governance, it is so fundamentally destabilizing for governments that can't keep up with climate change, whether on the resilient side or on the emergency side, because it compounds this loss of trust in institutions that we see in so many parts of the world. That's not just about you know, the export of surveillance technologies, you know, from the PRC or, um, you know, democratic de democracies being under attack by other, other means. There's also just things that are happening in the world that when a government can't keep up, it compounds that cynicism about institutions. So uh, this is a long way of saying we do governance work at USAID, we do education, we do public health. That's completely connected to climate as you look at changing malaria patterns. The WHO, I think, is, is predicting an additional 250,000 people who will have died by, by 2030 of climate-related, whether it's you know, heat stress or, or malaria uh, or water shortages, malnutrition that grows out of it. So what we, where we need to get as an agency is to embed uh, attention to resilience and attention to climate change and what it means for a community in everything we do. And, and you know, I, in a sense, USAID is a climate agency. Even if we still have a climate team that works, you know, as a climate team per se, mainstreaming this agenda is what our missions are trying to do uh, all around the world. And this is not because I, I anticipate the, you know, the concerns of some maybe in our in our domestic politics on this, and I'm sure you'll get there. But, uh, but you know, this isn't USAID foisting anything. This is the cri de corps you know, heard all around the world of this is a game changer. Our development trajectories were going here, COVID hit, and now we have what could feel like a COVID-like, 
not not of the same scale, but battering again and again and again. So just as we're now thinking differently about pandemic prevention, what should that lead us to think about when it when it comes to embedding climate in the mindset of all public spending and and all notions of mobiliz mobilizing private capital because that's of course going to be a big part of the solution. So we're tra that's it's this mainstreaming and not having climate live over here but given that it is this game changer and given the that it's the our host countries and the communities in which we work and have worked since John F Kennedy pleading, you know, give us more of the tools to adapt to this shell-shocking phenomenon. Well, I asked the question about economic development because, you know, with economic development comes, you know, perhaps um, better lives, better living conditions, which then can exacerbate um, the, the issues related to climate change. So how do you in, um, and I wrote it down really fast, the mainstreaming, how in mainstreaming climate in, in the things that you do, how do you find that balance between um, helping people help themselves while at the same time not doing it in a way that exacerbate the climate problems that we all have to face? Yeah, and I mean, I think, I think you're, you know, one example that I think that you're alluding to is, you know, as people get richer, they, they buy more meat and right. that causes, you know, more emissions or they travel more, they're flying more there. And you're you, absolutely, I mean, we've seen that that's the emissions trajectory in both the PRC and India are reflected of that. Our emissions trajectory, you know, back as we were um, bringing our economy online and modernizing, it absolutely reflects that. So I think that is profound. I will say the fact that solar power, um, the cost of solar has come down by 85%. Uh, the cost of wind is down by 55%. Um, where we work, uh, the demand signal for renewables is very, very significant, which doesn't get at meat eating and some of the other features of um, getting wealthier. Um, but it does get to the urgency of making clean energy transitions as these prices come down, it is a better bet. And so, so again, when we have these exchanges on the Hill and it look, you know, it looks to some who are skeptical somehow still of, of climate programming, you know, that we're bringing our green agenda to the countries and the communities we're working in. No, it's not like that at all. They're saying we can't afford this other thing, you know, but actually we can pop up a solar panel and have a, a water pump that we've been trying to get in this village. We can go off grid in ways we we never, well, the state's not gonna get here anytime soon. This was my experience out in uh, Bekaa Valley in, in Lebanon, where USAID worked to, to you know, build a, um, a bunch of solar panels that powered electricity and, and, and ended up actually reducing tension between refugees who were being generously sheltered by Lebanese host communities, Syrian refugees, and the Lebanese because they were no longer fighting over water because they had water because they had solar. But to attach to the, the grid, no way. And so then those tensions, who knows what would happen with that. So the idea that these investments are cost effective over time, that actually you can develop in, a, in along the lines of what you're describing in a clean way. I think the other aspects of consumption, um, uh, you know, need to be dealt with as part of civic education and as part of norm um, work uh, because it is true that in many, many societies, and again, including our own back in the day, you know, as you increase your, your livelihoods, your income, consumables are a very attractive way to, to expend those, those new resources. This feels like a high class problem <laughs> in most of the countries, you know, we're talking about, I mean, I'm talking about working with small scale farmers who are paying double this year for fertilizer than they were paying before Putin invaded Ukraine, who just need a little loan to be able to get access to some of those drought resistant seeds that are gonna increase yields by 25%. But again, finding the resources to get them that, getting the private sector interested in adaptation. Um, but you know, no question that we should be thinking now about you know, if we can be successful, if we can help them withstand the negative effects of climate change and like here in America, grow jobs out of also uh, these changes uh, to their economies, 
then what? Then we will be grappling with the kinds of things that have further fueled emissions in, in more recently developed countries. So as you've alluded to many times, there's a lot of good news related to um, development of clean energy alternatives. That being said, though, global emissions once again hit a record high in 2022. Carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has risen to levels not seen in millions of years. Uh, are we moving in the wrong direction, despite glimmers of hope? Well, I mean, I think all of us um, can answer that question in two ways. <laughs> <laughs> and we talk to ourselves all day, you know, on the one hand this and on the other hand that. Um, but what, what we can say is we're certainly not moving fast enough. And, you know, what breaks my heart is you, it's a little bit like another version of the vicious cycle you were kind of describing, but when you see the the wildfires and the rate of wildfires and then all of the carbon emitted and all of the good that had been done with carbon emission reductions and that being not washed away, whatever, you know, uh, smoked away, burned away, um, that's heartbreaking because these investments were, are accreting, they are building momentum. So I think that, and that's not the only thing that's heartbreaking, there's so much that's happening day to day, and, and a little bit of the despondency, I think, setting in as well, as people just open the newspaper, and um, whether it's in their own community, or one further afield, or even something like what happened in Libya, which just captures the imagination of, uh, yeah, which was its own sui generis issue with regard to governance and infrastructure, but was would not have happened that way but for the intensity of storm daniel which is which is just being seen in so many communities um but what i what i do think it's important to come back to at least as proof of concept is that uh at in paris the projections they were we we the world were on a track to warm four degrees and we are now on a track to warm 2.5 degrees so that is a reflection of the agency that people have claimed over this trajectory. The problem is we need to curb warming at 1.5 degrees. But in that delta from 4 to 2.5 uh, should give people at least uh, you know, a sense that actually collectively we are doing things that are making a difference. There's no doubt we are doing things that are making a difference. Um, if I could, though... I think the area that we we have, the, I mean, as, as John Kerry likes to say, you know, if we don't get mitigation right and the carbon reductions right, um, there'll be no planet to adapt. Um, he, he makes a comment like that a lot. We, we at USAID are in the mitigation and the adaptation business, as as is Secretary Kerry and his team. But I, I think in mitigation, what's what I think gives one hope is just how much the private sector has leapt now, recognizing that there's money to be made. And, and you know, I'd love to rely on people's good intentions and their feeling of fellow humanity, but it's much more reliable to if they think there's money to be made. And that shift has occurred, and you see it on the IRA, which is already defying even the, the best projections and, and extrapolations that people did. I mean, this is going to have way more collateral uh, effects and, and bring down carbon way more, I think, than, than people could have just strictly speaking anticipated because of a cascade now of private sector interest uh, fueled and catalyzed uh, by the underlying uh, legislation. And so, too, as the prices come down, again, there's virtuous cycles there. Adaptation, we're not, we're not there yeah, and I don't know if we're 10 years behind where we were on on mitigation, you know, where we are on mitigation. Like, is the same thing going to happen in 10 years where we look back and say, oh, we lost all that time? Why couldn't private sector actors have seen as well that there's good to be done and money to be made, I guess, if, if you have to think that way, around the insurance industry in the agricultural sector, um, in fintech, I mean, all these tools are going to be absolutely critical out in particularly rural areas and, and those areas that are most vulnerable to, to climate change. But about 2% of funding to adaptation comes from the private sector right now. And that has just got to change. So President Biden and we have done a big call to action to the private sector, um, but it's, it's, it's slow going. And, and even if you take, forget the specific sectors that have a direct nexus with 
uh, the need to, to build resilience, look at it in even more stark terms, the market share that so many companies are hoping to capture are themselves going to have less money to spend, maybe in flight, <laughs> maybe at war, um, you know, and so the positive of that is, hey, if we can help them adapt and, and be more resilient and where these uh, emergencies happen, but, uh, but don't wallop communities in the same way and they bounce back, uh, that's, those are consumers that will be our consumers. But the negative is what if, you know, millions, tens of millions of consumers are taken offline? Uh, because they are driven into poverty. The predictions now are 100 million more people driven into extreme poverty by 2030. But that's within our hand. That adaptation, there's so much, as I would say to my kids, there's room to grow. <laughs> 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 you know, the, the areas that are the most troubling in some ways, uh, there's, there's really room to grow. And, and you could see a cascade of the kind that we've seen on, on carbon mitigation. Administrator Power, we have almost, we got a minute and eight seconds, and, and this will be the final question. I mean, the name of this conference is This is Climate, Women Leading the Charge. So how do you see women reshaping climate leadership? Well, first of all, I have the chance to make an announcement here in my one minute and eight seconds uh, that I have 53. left. 53. Uh, uh, <laughs> we, um, we, USAID and Amazon, the company, not the forest, uh, launched uh, a gender equality fund, gender equity fund at COP. And uh, we launched it with $6 million in funding. And this is for women. It's for uh, projects that will benefit women. It's for projects that are driven by women in adaptation or in mitigation, the whole or protection of natural ecosystems, but things broadly in the climate space. And uh, today, uh, we have the Visa Foundation and Reckitts, a, a company out of the United Kingdom, who have joined us and matched that initial, oh, USA put in three million, Amazon put in three million, and, and have added uh, six million. Why do I mention this is not a huge amount of money yet? We are going to get up to 60 million, we hope, uh, in rapid order. This is part of another cascade that we would like to see. Um, we've put out a request for proposals. Incredible women leaders are putting uh, proposals in. These can be small uh, projects. A lot of the climate finance right now is not going to small projects. It's going to big international organizations. So working more with local partners is going to be absolutely key. Um, but these are going to be the success stories that are going to inspire people uh, to invest more and to believe that change can come. And it, sadly, there are just not that many examples of climate finance facilities that are targeted and tailored toward women, even though women are bearing the greatest brunt. And women, I think, in my experience, are doing the most innovative work uh, in dealing with the consequences of climate change and try to, to uh, lower those consequences in the years ahead. Samantha Power, the 19th Administrator of USAID, thank you very much for joining us today. Thanks, Jonathan. Next up, my colleague Julianne Eilprin, Deputy Climate and Environment Editor for The Washington Post, will be on stage with Salt Lake City Mayor Aaron Mendenhall after this video. Stay with us. Cities are where it's at. I know that Mayor Lumumba and I are biased, but we literally get to dig those holes, plant the trees, fix the infrastructure. We get to ask for the support from our state and our federal partners. But when it comes down to it, city is where the rubber meets the road. I'm pleased to be joined by the mayor of Salt Lake City, Aaron Mendenhall. Mayor Mendenhall, welcome. 
Thank you for having me. I'm so happy to be here. Excellent. Uh, since environmental issues spurred your entrance into politics, could you tell us the story of how you went from uh, air quality activist to the mayor of Salt Lake City? Yes. Um, I think everybody has a moment that triggers you to decide you have to do something. And maybe you know that moment for yourself, how you started your career, you founded a nonprofit or something. And my moment was when my now 17 year old was an infant. He was uh, just a few weeks old. He was a fat nine pound one ounce baby. <laughs> and I, um, I'd studied biology a little bit, but I in no way was a air quality anything. I didn't know anything. And he was born during an inversion, Salt Lake City is an amazing place for so many reasons, but it's in a bowl-shaped valley with mountains on both sides. So we amass pollution, particle pollution, in the winter months and end up with a temperature inversion, sometimes for days or weeks during our winter. And the cumulative impact I learned while listening to a local NPR station holding my fat baby, um, and I learned listening that my legislature, our state legislature that day had just received a report that the cumulative impact of breathing these, these uh, sometimes in the summer, sometimes in the winter, really a handful of days a year on one's life can take two years off of a person's longevity, just living in this valley. And I felt like I had to leave, like we needed to get in the car before the radio show was over and be gone. But really before the show was over, I knew, um, I was going to do something. And so I started by volunteering, learning from physicians and environmental health people who were also compelled to do something and found some mentors. Eventually I was hired for a little nonprofit that was just starting up. I was the first employee and we were community organizers. I was activating, putting protests together, um, getting people to feel like I felt. But I knew I wanted to be inside the meetings that we were outside protesting. And so we founded a new nonprofit that uh, it's called Breathe Utah. It's still doing great work, but worked from a science realm to bring policy proposals forward to our supermajority Republican legislature that would finally start getting some wheels under them. And I found that I really liked that work. And eventually someone said, you should run for city council. And I laughed. <laughs> and, and, and six or seven more asks, eventually I said yes, and now I'm in my 10th year in City Hall, six years as City Council, and my fourth year as Mayor. Got it. And so if being a mother in many ways kind of drew you into politics, how has that and being a woman shaped both your decision to run, you mentioned it took a few asks to get you uh, to engage, and also how you operate now that you're in office? I've, I've only ever been a woman, so I can't, you know, I can't give you the contrast, but when I ran the first time in 2013, only 16% of all elected offices in my state were held by women. 16. That's pathetic. And at the time, um, our seven-member city council had one woman, and a, a, our, our mayor at the time was a man, and she was the only woman who was retiring. And it was really what pushed me to finally say, I'm going to try this, I'm going to get into the race, was thinking about an all-male city council and a man as the mayor running our blue dot amazing city that needed more voices at the table. So it was that inequity in representation that was the final straw. And have those numbers changed? We're about 25%, 26% okay. of elected offices now okay. in the state. Um, and tackling climate change by definition um, involves collective action, right? There's no way that individual countries or states or right. cities and or you know nations can do it, um, and and also consensus building. So, do you have thoughts on how you and some of the other women leaders you've met approach this somewhat differently compared to you know others, or do you feel like there's no real distinction and 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 this is you know, this is an issue that other people, that everyone has been able to, you know, master what it means to address collectively. I think that I find myself in rooms with many other women or mostly other women around most of the, uh, the great challenges that we're facing globally, but at a community level as well. I'm talking about 
the environmental injustice that's on the west side of Salt Lake City, our formerly redlined neighborhoods that are dealing with you know, absentee issues at our public schools. They're dealing with lack of access to fresh food. We have uh, resident food organizers in our community, mostly women showing up there. Transit access, you know, an I-15 expansion proposal that UDOT is looking at right now. A lot of women show up. And why that is, um, I only know for myself. Mm -hmm. But uh, certainly we have allies, and it's not always only the women. Um, but I think that telling your story and the vulnerability of that personal reason, your own tipping point that, that I told you at the beginning, isn't a gendered experience to tell. Um, you know, men and women can tell their stories alike, but I think that there's something compelling about the authenticity and the invitation. Um, and I see women doing that in both the reason they're engaged, but also the inspiration to keep going on an issue that can be as exhausting and frustrating as climate change. Why are we still in this? Why are we showing up? Because there's tremendous hope, and because there's a bunch of kick-ass women that you have on this panel today who are doing amazing work. And um, I think that, that authenticity of working together, of being excited, of showing the hope that there is, and the reason that we keep doing it is something I see women doing more often than men, um, which I'd love to see that change. And um, Salt Lake City is booming, obviously. And I'm curious if you could both talk about why it's attracting kind of the investment and the jobs that we've seen in recent years. And also, what are the challenges, the, both the opportunities and the challenges that it presents when you're committed to conservation and environmental goals like, like yourself? Yeah, Utah is the fastest growing state in the nation, about 18.4% growth, um, 2010 to 2020 census, and we've continued with that growth. Salt Lake City has grown quite a bit. We hovered around 180,000 residents in our little 110 square miles um, for decades, and we've added about 20,000 residents in the last two decades. And interestingly enough, we've decreased our water consumption by more than 20% over that course of time. So the way that we're growing is, I think, something that other cities around the state of Utah who are also experiencing growth challenges are interested in because the costs associated, the livability of that, um, not only the environmental reasons, but the day-to-day -day quality of life. And our growth is very focused from a city aspect on um, the ways that we can leverage the private market to give us more of the solutions that we need. Housing costs are very difficult in Salt Lake City. Um, they've been escalating. Homelessness is a challenge that we see in capital cities, medium-sized cities across the country. We're experiencing that as well. And the threats of the Great Salt Lake and its shrinkage and the dust toxicity um, and the way the wind blows is right into Salt Lake City. So these are challenges that we can address at the local level with things like land use, low interest rate loans that we give, and we will not loan any longer for new buildings unless they are all electric and they are climate friendly. So we need those kind of technologies, but of course we can't control the, bu the building codes that's set by our state legislature. Oh, okay. So we have to put our money on the table or change the land use codes uh, okay. to get the solutions that we need. And the businesses are showing up. Okay. It's happening. Is there any real prospect building codes, obviously, which is super wonky, but has significant implications for energy use, for climate. Is there any prospect of that changing in the near future, or is there just not enough support in the legislature for that? There has been some incremental change. And just the way that we've been able to improve our air quality is the way that the building codes will also change, which is that the business case becomes very clear. Um, the technologies become actually more affordable than the traditional way of building. And so electricity and creating buildings that are 100% electrified um, is a good business model right now. And I think when the city, our blue dot, leads out on some of these new policies, um, we do see the state both examine what's going on and then sometimes implement at the state level. So we're happy to be that progressive testing ground.
Got it. And so let's talk about the Great Salt Lake, which um, first hit a record low in the summer of 2021. Um, and there was a story just today, right, in the Tribune saying that the record snowpack was a temporary re reprieve, but basically for a couple years. So there's a coalition of environmental groups that recently filed a lawsuit against the state of Utah, arguing that officials have pushed the Great Salt Lake to the brink of collapse. Do you think that state officials are doing enough to protect the Great Salt Lake? And what else should they be doing? The actions that they took in the last legislative session were phenomenal, and I don't believe that they believe they're done. We hear from them, and we hear from the scientists who led the initial study that said we have five years left uh, of this lake, and then the ecosystem is gone. And the legislature responded. Um, we know that of all the water that could drain into the Great Salt Lake, more than 80% of it is going to mining or agriculture, my majority going to agriculture, about 72%. Cities and local industries, about 9% total. And the Salt Lake City is a tiny bit in there. So influencing the big mining industries and the agricultural aspect is a legislative function. I, don't, I know there's been a lot of attention on Salt Lake City. It is our namesake. Yes. Uh, but, and we have been doing some pretty uh, aggressive policies, rate increases. Um, but to have farmers pass on that water, not grow their crops, and not lose their water rights, but be able to receive some funding from the state is new and empowered by a $40 million trust they put together. We need this action to continue. And the reporting that you mentioned today is uh, based on the work of these same scientists that the legislature has been listening to. So what they suggest, we've seen it come to fruition in the legislative session, and we hope to see more of that in January. OK. And then part of what you, you mentioned earlier is this idea that toxic chemicals, including arsenic, lead, and mercury that mm -hmm. are right now trapped in the lake bag, as, it becomes, as the lake bed becomes more exposed, um, these chemicals are carried into the air and create toxic dust storms. Um, so in terms of, you, you've talked about how Salt Lake has obviously taken some precaution, some steps to kind of reduce its water consumption. Is there anything that the city can do in terms of restoring it that you feel like is action that's important for Salt Lake City to do at this point? There's, all, there's been some other reporting mm -hmm. around lithium extraction mm -hmm. and this frenzy of businesses trying to yeah. figure out how to, especially in the highly saline parts of the lake, yes. extract lithium from right. the brine that is in there. Right. And these are typically really water intensive processes. Right. Uh, more water than we use as an entire city, capital city in a year, yeah. uh, much, much more. And the pressures on cities like ours to be able to dedicate the outflow from our water treatment facility, which is just over 13 billion gallons of water a year. Mm -hmm. It flows into the Great Salt Lake, but it could be forced to be diverted. Okay. And so we are right now working to finalize our legal assurances with the state of Utah, which uh -huh. is only newly available to cities in the last two years, mm -hmm. so that we control and permanently dedicate all 13 billion gallons to the lake. Mm -hmm. So that should a big um, semiconductor manufacturer yeah. or a lithium extractor plant come into the state and get them really excited about an industry that are yeah. what we can't afford from a water aspect, okay. it will be secured. Got it. Well, let's talk specifically. You anticipated my next question, which is that um, the Washington Post has been doing a series this year about the implications of the expansion of electric vehicles and what it means in terms of, obviously, uh, the critical minerals and uh, components that go into that. And so lithium uh, you know, is something that really matters. And there's a proposal right now from Water Leaf Resources which says that it will restore billions of gallons of water that it's going to require from the Great Salt Lake. Uh, and the question is, can it? Will it? Should should this uh, venture be permitted? What's your? Do you have a position on that? That's the question the state is asking right now. They've also acquired some natural water rights, so not salty water from the lake, but mm -hmm. uh, the non-saline water that we're taking from the tap. They're saying that they would put actually more water back into the lake than they take out because they'd be combining it with this fresh water that they flush the process with at the end. Um, we haven't heard from the Department of Natural Resources at the state whether or not this system, which is a very new and unpiloted, as far as we know, uh, process, is actually going to be able to do that. 
So I'm grateful that the state is taking a skeptical look at an unvetted process that wants many billions of gallons of water out of the lake, many times more than our entire city uses. Um, we should be skeptical of this, and we should do nothing that harms the lake. Every economy, not just mineral extraction, every part of our city, the entire ski industry, everything would be affected if we lose the lake. There would be no Salt Lake City. Um, and I'm curious about, you know, we've seen a huge number of extreme weather events, right, occur um, uh, across, the, across the country, across the globe. And I'm curious of whether, how it's, in what ways has it changed the kind of leadership playbook for mayors, for lack of a better term? Has it, you know, provided more opportunities to engage on climate change? Has it strained budgets to an extent that doesn't allow you to devote the resources you want to making progress on some of your goals? How, how have you coped with this and what has it meant for you? Salt Lake City being a historically democratic city um, in our very red state has taken every opportunity to come to the table anytime we're invited or anytime we see a conversation that we feel like we should be in, we find a way to pull a chair up. And the lake and the crisis of the lake has expanded those opportunities and it's caused other cities, other mayors in the state to look at what we've been doing and what we're developing in terms of our policy, even our rate structure of increasing over time um, and they're asking us, how, how can we do that? Can you help, can you share that with us? Um, and at the state level, we are helping to develop the water budget for the Great Salt Lake through our public utilities director, Laura Briefer, who's amazing, not only at directing the public utilities of Salt Lake City, but telling the story and the history of water's relationship to the settlement of our valley. And Although agriculture is the main source here and that is not part of what's happening in Salt Lake City, mm -hmm. I think that the relationship that Utahns have with the Great Salt Lake has taken a massive turn. People didn't value the lake very much. It can smell funky when the wind blows off of it. You don't take your ski boat out and you don't take your family to the beach and play at the Great Salt Lake. It's a very salty body of water and it smells funky sometimes. <laughs> But now we all love the lake in the last two years because I think that we, we kind of recognize the lack of appreciation and now it's over, we're overcompensating it. with care and concern. And other cities are, are grateful, I think, to turn to what we've proven out already in Salt Lake. And do people think about and talk about water differently now? Again, yeah. this past year was, was quirky in terms of obviously what we saw in terms of the snowpack and rainfall, but obviously right before that we were at this unbelievable crisis point and did, is that also part of how people are thinking slightly differently? Yeah, I was really concerned this winter with the epic snowfall rates that we had um, that people were going to lose their concern about the lake and it's, I think everyone seemed to have that same worry. Um, it's not the case. Yellow is the new green in Salt Lake. Um, people are xeriscaping. We are planting more trees at the same time. Um, to help reduce our heat island effect, and uh, people are, people are very inspired. Um, and while there are fewer Americans who, you know, for example, deny how human activity is helping drive climate change, the issue, both in terms of the causes and and the solutions, is still polarizing, and the two parties remain pretty far apart. And we've seen that in recent polling that the Washington Post has done, and obviously others. How, obviously, you've spent time trying to diffuse that level of polarization um, as a Democratic mayor in a, in a Republican-dominated state. How, how do you go about doing that? I live in the Southwest, the area of the United States most affected by climate change. And it is undeniable that we've been experiencing um, incredible impacts already from climate change extreme weather events, the drought that we have been in and we continue even despite our epic winter, um, the crisis of the lake. Uh, th this is, it's reaching undeniable proportions. Now what has to happen with climate change is very acute to Utahns. Um, from an air quality perspective, we're already primed to care very much at the local level about 
carbon emissions and the impacts on our health. But with that, that coupling with the lake and the crisis of the lake has made the climate struggle very personal. Um, and in, I think that we see this, the water crisis playing out in all parts of the West. But the lake is, we're talking about months for us to take action, not decades, not 2030. The lake will be gone if we haven't made the decisions by 2030 when we are trying to meet our carbon goals. And so how do you hear Republicans in your state talking about climate change that might be different from what people would hear from national Republicans or you know, the most recent you know, Republican presidential debate? I think that our, our Utah Republicans talk about it in terms of our livability and pres uh, preserving our quality of life. They recognize the majority of our, our legislature are rural representatives and agriculture and mining and industry is a big part of those economies. They want to be able to preserve their communities, but they recognize that the resources that they've relied on are dwindling. And um, th this isn't about climate change. You don't hear a lot of Utah Republicans talking about climate change. But they'll talk about the Great Salt Lake and the water crisis. And you know, if in the end, the actions that we take to save our lake are characterized as, as local um, and have nothing to do with climate change from the rhetoric coming out of the legislature, I'm okay with that. We still have to take the action. Excellent. Well, thank you. This has been fascinating. Mayor Mendenhall, we will be watching to see what happens in Salt Lake City and in Utah. Thanks so much for joining us here today. Thanks for having me, Julia. <laughs>
And so that's the importance of the event today. But, but I'm hopeful that events like this and the way this room is filled with so, so many amazing women, uh, there, there are men here as well, but I'm hopeful that this <laughs> is, and, and we love you. And, and they're and, amazing and we, too. And we want you, and we, want too. you and, okay. we, and we need you. Um, but I, I think that this could be that moment where people can not just reflect on the great work that we've heard of earlier today on, on the panel, but really how can we make sure that this is the future? of fighting climate and, and also hopefully using water as that tool of fighting climate change, which I, I think that it's still really uh, not really known. What are the consequences when you don't have a diverse group of, of stakeholders uh, around the table when you're fighting climate change? Well, I think um, it really is indicative of what we see today. I mean, because we haven't had a diverse group of stakeholders, and this is globally, and this, of, of course, is um, women also leading, we haven't even talked about water um, because it's so critical, and most people don't understand that the first impact of climate change is water. But the, what they also don't realize is water is a tool to helping us fight climate change. And so I'm really proud, of course, to work for a company that understands that and has really helped me understand that. I've only been with the company two years, but I had no clue how powerful water was at solving some of these acute issues that we're facing right now with climate change. You began your career at the State Department then you worked on the Hill for yes. Senator Grassley. Um, you held positions of leadership at several major global corporations. And then you were also a woman in, woman in agriculture for seven years. And there I know you are guaranteed to have been in the minority. So you've got a lot of insight on this. What do you think? Uh, what have you seen is really key to helping women uh, be accepted as an integral part of management teams? I think that part of it is working and collaborating um, with other women as well. Uh, I, I think that oftentimes we think that we can be the only in the room. Um, and I also think that previously it's been thought that once we have children or get married that we have to dial back um, because a lot of workplaces have not been very forward leaning in accepting the full woman. Uh, and, and I think all of that is very important. And so I think that when people like me and, of course, people like you, when we're in power, it's important for us to talk about these issues. Um, I'm very fortunate that I can talk about these issues with my CEO. He is uh, a big promoter of diversity, inclusion, and equity. And Your company's won awards, right? Absolutely. But I, I think awards are great, which is sometimes what happens. We rest on our laurels. Um, what I love about it, it's, okay, we've, we've done okay, but we need to do better. And, and so I, there's still room to grow, but I, I really feel like everyone in this chair, regardless of our title, has a role to play in, in making sure that there are more women uh, in leadership positions. Senior Vice President of Government Relations at Ecolab, you are basically a liaison between the public and the private sectors. And I want to kind of segue now to talk about climate change. How do you think effective partnerships can play a role in really moving the ball forward? Well, part of it is just based on my experience. I mean, when working in the government and you can see, the, of course, the power of the government, but you realize government cannot solve all of society's problems without civil society, NGOs, and other you know, business leaders, uh, we won't be able to deal and manage some of these uh, huge issues like climate change. And so I, I think that that's the key um, to making sure that we're inclusive um, when we're leading, and that's the power of public-private partnerships. And what I've seen just in my short time with Ecolab is their work through the Water Resilience Coalition, um, which we co-founded in 2020, um, is really an exciting example of what a public-private partnership can be. And while it's run out of the UN Global Compact, I mean, you have 32 other companies that uh, were initially involved, and I think we're up to 36 now. And they're really working to um, help preserve and restore water basins throughout the world. And so they've already tackled, um, I think in five countries, 18 water basins. And that's important because we don't think about it, but you know, there are a lot of other people in other countries, which you've traveled um, quite a bit, that don't have access to drinking water, that don't have access to sanitation. Uh, and, and so this is not our problem of today, 
but it is the problem of today for many people um, outside of this room. And so I think that beyond it being a business imperative, um, because you need water in every component of a business, whether it's producing a product, um, a new chip uh, that goes into your phone, while we don't realize that, um, there are so many aspects that are diverse stakeholders are involved, that this is why we need that inclusivity, this is why we need diverse thought in solving these uh, types of problems. Following through on, on pledges, we all know it is vital to reaching net zero. Uh, have you seen a disconnect at all in the private sector between the pledges that are made and the actions that are taken? Unfortunately, yes, and I think that's been probably a common theme um, uh, with all of the panelists, and so it's, I think it's a well-known fact, and, and just this morning, Ecolab, in celebration of uh, Climate Week, uh, we um, released our study, uh, the Ecolab uh, Watermark Study, that actually talks about society's views uh, on water and, and how they feel about water. And it's the largest Ecolab study that addresses this. But the importance of it is what society is saying. Uh, it was over 80% of society that feels like that business and government is not doing enough to solve the issues of water security. And, and so that's more important. But it's also important because we need society to move government to want to do more about this. I mean, so public-private partnerships are great. Um, but we need civil society that's pushing in this area. And what was interesting to me is just 80% uh, of Americans find this as a critical issue. Uh, water security is a critical issue. I, of course, we just heard from the mayor, um, and she's doing great work. Um, but it's, it's not just in Salt Lake uh, City that um, this is an issue. It really is. Nationwide. Yeah, absolutely. As you said. Throughout the United States. But, Moving the needle on climate change obviously requires working together, uh, people taking actions and collaborating in ways they may never have before in the past. Can you give us some effective partnerships or collaborations that you have seen that could be role models for other corporations? Well, I do think that it, it's maybe a little bit easier for us because we understand that if our clients are successful, we, we look at that's our success. But I think that's a model not just for us, but also even maybe for governments when they're looking at these types of issues. Uh, I would say when I think about like the Inflation Reduction Act, I mean, regardless of your views of it, it is a view of trying to push the private sector into building the green economy to deal with some of these climate issues. And actually, water is a part of uh, that as a tool. And so I, I think that that is one example. But I think the other example is um, really creative investment mechanisms. And so if you think about that woman in India who doesn't have access to um, water or she doesn't have access to sanitation. And there are now creative investment tools that can offer microfinance loans uh, to women. And from what I understand, there's a 94% payback rate of, of the loans. And so it's, it sounds like it's something that's just based on uplifting civil society. Um, but you also increase an employer's and employee's productivity if you don't have to go and, and walk miles to get clean drinking water. Uh, and also it's security and safety for women because oftentimes what will happen in some countries where women are not created, you know, or thought of as equal, is that there are rapes and other horrible things that happen to women when they go out to an outhouse or some other place where they don't have an in-house bathroom. So I think that it impacts all of us, even if it's not in our backyard. Sure. And, and then water just is so central to improving health. Absolutely. Globally, when so many people do not have access to, to clean water. I mean, well, we know even here in the United States, Absolutely. Jackson, Mississippi, we have communities Absolutely. wrestling Absolutely, in with Flint, this. Michigan. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I, we live in Washington, D.C. Some people <laughs> say even in Washington, D.C., you know, we should be concerned. But I think the other um, aspect that I think about is when we think about um, EVs and we think about chips, all of those are water intensive industries. And so we don't think about those are really um, sustainable. That's a sustainable future for us, but we actually have to be sustainable when we're trying to manufacture those products. But that's what you do, right? In Absolutely. Ecolab, you help them. Right. Well, that's the exciting part of our partnership, <laughs> and it's really cool to be able to do that. 
So as we begin to wrap, is there anything else you think that businesses should keep in mind when, when building partnerships uh, to tackle the climate crisis? I think uh, being diverse in the stakeholders that you talk to, um, understanding that you don't have to have all of the answers, and that's one of the other beauties of having women lead. Um, we're very open to listening and, and not always needing to have all of the answers. And these are issues that affect so many stakeholders that have the right to have a seat at the table. And I think that from what I've learned from not just the speakers today, but some of the other speakers and other panels, uh, there are a lot of solutions that are already readily available. It's just scaling them, and it's, it's just making sure that people are aware of them. And so hopefully that this can open up people's eyes, that it doesn't have to be just viewed as a green tax to be sustainable. It can make your business more effective um, and, and a greater value proposition. And from the you know, Ecolab Watermark study, it can even help you with your customers because that customer sentiment, um, they care now more than ever how you're manufacturing your products. Um, I would like to sort of close with a, with a story from the heart from you, because I know you came to Ecolab from all these fabulous other companies where you've worked, and again, uh, being part of the federal government as well, and serving even around the world in Africa, I know you have. Why um, Ecolab? Why is their cause and what they do so important? Uh, to, to you, to the world, help us understand that. Well, I, I think that for me, we all have a choice, right? I feel like everyone in this audience has a superpower. Um, and it's really about tapping into that and working with people that can help your dreams come true. And I found that in Ecolab. They want to do good while actually making money. And I know that sounds blasphemous or maybe bad to some people, but I think that that's the only way that we can tackle climate change is if we actually have a model that goes beyond philanthropy, but instead is something uh, sustainable. Uh, and so that is my view. It's like that, that happy marriage of all of my experiences um, because I love my public service, but to be able to join a company that really wants to do great stuff for the world, um, it's inspiring to me. And my T-shirt says, do more of what you love. <laughs> and that's what I'm doing and honored to do today. So thanks for um, asking. Yeah. Well, and I, I know people even you can go, I think one of the cool things on your website is you can go and see the difference that the company is making every day. Uh, that ticker, yes. it ticks off how many... Is it billions yes. of gallons yes. of water you help uh, companies save. around the world right. save, and that's helping save the planet? Absolutely. Right? Tell All us how that, how that works. What exactly? Uh, so the Ecolab Water Monetizer is basically capturing all of the data from all of the work of our engineers that are on site for our customers that are doing great work. We're helping them do it, but they, they are inspired and want to do the work, but it's, it's global. And so this is tracking 24-7 uh, because it's digital and it's you know run by the sensors in their uh, actual systems in their companies. And so it's real time cool. what we're saving every day. And there's a level of transparency to it that I think um, also helps you be more accountable. And sometimes I think that's what's missing uh, to a lot of the commitments that are made. Um, so it could be a good model as to what we could do more of in that sense. Excellent. Tiffany Atwell, Senior Vice President of Government Relations at Ecolab, thank you so much for joining me. Well, thank you for having me. Mm -hmm. thank, 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 thank you. Thank you all. And uh, now uh, stay in your seats, and I will turn it back over to my friends at The Washington Post. Have a great afternoon. We need to eliminate greenhouse gas emissions from electricity, transportation, agriculture, industry, and buildings. We need to protect and restore ecosystems. We need to change society, policy, economy, and culture. This is about transformation.
how did this become a Republican versus Democrat thing in the first place? Well, it didn't used to be. Back in the 1990s, you asked Republicans and Democrats about it, you get the same answer. So what happened? What happened is people realized, uh-oh, if we fix it, that means no more coal, no more oil, and no more natural gas. Uh -huh. And it turns out that only 90 companies produced two-thirds of all the heat-trapping gases that are causing climate change since the dawn of the industrial era. You could fit their CEOs in three buses. talking with atmospheric scientist, Dr. Katherine Hayhoe, and marine biologist, Dr. Ayanna Elizabeth Johnson. Welcome to you both. Thanks for having us. Thank you. This summer, as we were just seeing, has been marked by extreme heat, fires, floods, storms across the globe, and it obviously seems like an inflection point to many. Uh, Dr. Johnson, to start with you, do we know how much of the summer's heat is driven by climate change versus El Nino conditions in the Pacific? And can you help us understand this moment, especially as we are at a, a critical point? I kind of want to turn to you for that question. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the thing that I think is most striking when we think about the relationship of the ocean and climate is more than 90% of the excess heat um, that's been trapped by greenhouse gases has been absorbed by the ocean. So the ocean is actually a hero when we think about mm -hmm. our climate situation, because without that, we'd be dozens of degrees mm -hmm. warmer in the atmosphere. Um, and also absorbing all this carbon dioxide is changing the chemistry of seawater. It just boggles my mind that the pH of the entire ocean has shifted because of all this combusting of fossil fuels. So I'm not exactly sure what percentage of this summer's exciting weather we can um, blame right. on El Nino versus climate change. Do you know? The larger part. So in the area, <laughs> that's why it's that, to that, always have two That much I knew, but I was like, do we have a percent? Exactly. For, for specific yeah. events, we absolutely do. In fact, that's at the cutting yeah. edge of science these mm -hmm. days, is we can put a number now on just how much more likely or worse climate change made a certain event. This is the attribution science. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And it's very powerful because let me give you an example from Hurricane Harvey. To this date, the most expensive disaster in the United States. We know that, that almost 40% of the rain that fell during Hurricane Harvey would not have fallen if it wasn't for climate change supersizing the hurricane, primarily through ocean heat. Mm -hmm. But then we know that the actual damages, three quarters of the damages, were because of that supersizing of the hurricane. So we can add to it, and they've extended that to looking at wildfire. 37% of the area burned by wildfire in the last 40 years was because of 88 companies. Again, the CEOs in the buses. Um, <laughs> and that is really powerful connector. There was a new study, actually, that just even came out looking at the area of ice loss and the number of polar bears endangered. They can track that back to that company endangered, this number of polar bears. So you can put numbers on exactly how much worse we are making things. And the answer is typically a lot. Got it. Excellent. Um, or, well, excellent answer. Let me <laughs> modify that yeah. for fear of it being misinterpreted. <laughs> Dr. Right. Um, as the world contended with all these extreme weather events, at the mm -hmm. same time, we've seen a tremendous expansion of clean energy here in the United States. And how should we understand these competing ideas and kind of the implications for both of these trends, which appear to be happening, frankly, faster than we had anticipated on both fronts. They are. So I truly believe that we are reaching not one, but two positive tipping points. Now, as a climate scientist, you normally hear the phrase tipping points in the sense of the climate is going to reach a tipping point. And the, there are physical tipping points in the climate system that would put us past a point of no return for that part of the system. But I'm talking about tipping points in our human society. And the first tipping point I think that we're rapidly approaching is the tipping point of getting rid of psychological distance. For a long time, people see climate change as it's a future issue, not now, or it's over there, but not here. And now people realize it is now, it is here, it is affecting the people, places, things I love. And we have reached the point where the balance of people in the US and around the world are worried about climate change. And that is a great first step. But it's only the first step. The second step is we have to figure out what to do about it, because you could have the whole world worried, but if we don't know what to do, we do nothing. 
So there, the trends that we are seeing in clean energy are incredibly encouraging because you're right, they are happening exponentially. I live in Texas, which is the number one producer of wind in the country. When I moved there 15 years ago, they weren't even on the charts for solar. And this year, they overtook California as the number one solar producer, too. I feel like if things can change in Texas, they can change anywhere. <laughs> now, a question about what we've seen with this clean energy expansion, both domestic and globally, is to what extent, and this would really be for both of you, are we seeing an energy transition or an energy addition? In other words, mm -hmm. you know, how much are we truly seeing the kind of decarbonization that, for example, you were talking about in the beginning? I think a lot of that depends on sort of how Inflation Reduction Act is implemented, right? There are all these tax credits in there for, for homeowners. There's all this encouragement for, um, you know, local manufacturing of heat pumps and, um, you know, electric cars and all of this. So I think a lot of that we don't exactly know how that's going to play out in the next few years, but what we are seeing so far is that it is changing things faster than we had anticipated. Mm -hmm. So many companies are taking advantage of this. So many homeowners are, you know, switching to induction stoves, putting in heat pumps, getting solar panels on the roofs because the tax credits are just change the equation for what people can afford. Now, there are a lot of ways in which, you know, those tax credits don't really work for people who don't have a tax burden, who are too poor to pay up front. Um, so there's certainly some, like, very significant justice issues in how um, that will be implemented that we really have to keep our eye on and, and think about how how to thread that needle much, much better. Um, but I'm actually really excited about a lot of the trends that we're starting to see around there in ways that I just didn't think domestic manufacturing mm. would ramp up as quickly as it has to sort of keep up with this need. I mean, people are having trouble mm -hmm. getting the installers. So I, one of the things that I'm really excited about is thinking about the, uh, the opportunity for just a whole new generation of people who can do green jobs in this country and, and, and really eager to see what the Biden administration might do to support that. I mean, a lot of the um, promises when Biden and others were running for election was, what about a civilian climate core? This idea that was popularized by Jay Inslee and carried on by Elizabeth Warren before yeah. Biden picked it up. And I think that's something that could be a huge benefit um, to this nation if we're thinking about like how to really invest in um, making sure people are ready for this transition. We just like don't have enough electricians and solar installers and green building retrofitters. I mean, it's so important to remember we have hundreds of millions of buildings in this country that need to be transitioned um, to renewables. And that's just like a big physical task. Okay, we're now going to discuss an, uh, an issue that matters, I know, to both of us, Dr. Johnson, which is that the ocean covers, you know, about 70% of the Earth's surface, yet it's often missing from mm -hmm. conversations about climate change. Why do you think that it's, and, and, and if you had to convey why the ocean should be more central to the climate mm -hmm. conversation, how would you do that? The ocean is a huge part of our climate system. I mean, when we think about the way that heat moves around the planet, a lot of it is in the ocean. A lot of it is absorbed by the ocean. Major ocean currents are moving heat around the planet. If we think about um, you know, why Europe isn't frozen, um, I think a lot of the times we think about the ocean as a source of the climate problem or the risk or threats. We think about sea level rise. We maybe think about hurricanes. Maybe we understand that they are strengthened as the waters are warming, making them you know, stronger and wetter, more dangerous. Um, but I don't think people think enough about the ocean as a source of climate solutions. So if we think about um, how all these things add up, we think about coastal ecosystems that are absorbing all this carbon and buffering us from the impact of storms, all of those wetlands, mangroves, um, seagrasses, coral reefs, those are really important natural protection from storm surge and hurricanes. Um, we think about offshore renewable energy right now, primarily that's wind, but there's potential for a lot of other different varieties of that. Um, we can also think about regenerative farming in the ocean of seaweeds mm -hmm. and shellfish as a really low impact form of um, supporting domestic food security. And so if we add all that up and figuring out cleaning up shipping and ports, this is like 20% of our climate solution that could mm -hmm. be coming from the ocean. And so when I look at a lot of climate policy and I don't see the ocean included in there, I'm like, well, this is an incomplete solution if we're not including the ocean. So I feel like 
a lot of what I do is just raise my hand in every climate <laughs> yeah. conversation. I'm like, also the ocean. Yeah. We can't actually do this if we leave the ocean out of the equation. Have yeah. you ever thought of just getting like a whole outfit that just says, I am the ocean? <laughs> just sitting there pointing to it. It's a lot of responsibility to like be the ocean. Exactly. But I, I just think you can it off. <laughs> Um, and Dr. Hayhoe, can you talk a little about feedbacks in the carbon cycle and why they matter and what we need to know about them, particularly at this moment? Mm -hmm. Well, feedbacks in the climate system as a whole, yeah. um, we have as far back as we can go in the history of this planet, and paleoclimate science goes back hundreds, hundreds of thousands, millions of years, we have never pushed the planet this far, this fast. The closest analog to what's happening today was 55 million years ago, when clearly we did not have 8 billion people on the planet and $50 trillion worth of infrastructure. And at that point, according to our best estimates, the amount of carbon going into the atmosphere on an annual basis back at the time of extremely rapid warming, the fastest we've ever seen, was a tenth of what we're putting into the atmosphere today. So this is an unprecedented experiment we're conducting with the only home we have. And when people say, well, what do we have to do to save the planet? I'm like, the planet is going to be orbiting the sun long after we're gone. What do we have to do to save us? And by us, I mean us humans and all the living things that share this planet with us. Because when we go back in the past, times of rapid change have been characterized by a word, and that word is extinctions. Um, <laughs> would be great to avoid that this time around. I yes. think the good news is, like, we really do have most of the solutions we need. There's a lot of talk about, like, the need for technological innovation to address this crisis, but, like, we really mm -hmm. do have the solutions we need. We have renewable energy. We know how to, ship, we know how to develop public transit. We know about re regenerative agriculture. Mm -hmm. We know about how to retrofit buildings. Like, we just, we know not only what to do, but how to do it, and it really is a matter of, like, how quickly and building the political will mm -hmm. and making sure people are trained to actually do the, the physical change changes that need to happen. And just, I think this last summer, mm -hmm. um, as Catherine was describing, has like really helped mm -hmm. us with this social tipping point mm -hmm. of like people are awake. Mm -hmm. Like the sky in New York was orange yeah. because of wildfires mm -hmm. in Canada, right? Mm -hmm. Like we had a hurricane just head to Maine. We had a hurricane mm -hmm. just head yeah. towards LA. People are seeing that this is here and now. Mm -hmm. um, and I think maybe it's not so much a sense of urgency that's changed, but a sense of like practicality. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, we, we have to actually mm -hmm. deal with this and there are steps that we okay. can take. And I love, I, that's, that's the mindset I want everyone to be in that like solution oriented, okay, who's doing what, like, let's go. Okay, what's a solution like that Dr. Johnson hasn't named that you would mm. say that you think is a critical piece you, of the- Oh, could we just go back and forth on yeah. our favorite climate <laughs> solution? Just, just a little, then we're gonna get back into Composting. some of the depressing <laughs> topics, but Composting, I feel like we're gonna run with, we're gonna run with this. <laughs> you read it, my mind because uh -huh. that was literally what was going through my mind as you were what talking. Else? What else? Okay. okay. So when people say mitigation, yeah, they usually jump to clean energy. Okay. But the cheapest form of energy is what? The energy you don't, don't use. So efficiency in our energy use and our food use, we waste 67% of the energy we produce and half the food. Mm -hmm. There are people going hungry, and there's food rotting producing greenhouse gases because we are wasting it. So just recognizing that everything has value. We are just such a wasteful society, and everybody can get on board with what our grandparents taught us, right? Waste not, want not, a pinch, in, you know, a, a, an ounce of prevention is worth a, a pound of cure. Mm -hmm. Stitch in time saves nine. There's all these adages for it. <laughs> so that's one. And then the other one is one you alluded to, but I want to call it directly, which is nature. Mm -hmm. So at the Nature Conservancy, our scientists have calculated that putting carbon, you asked about the carbon cycle, putting carbon back in nature where we want it instead of up in the atmosphere where we have too much of it, because carbon is not bad. Mm -hmm. We are carbon-based life forms. It's in the wrong place. In the wrong place. Yes. Yeah. So moving it around using nature is an incredible climate solution that could account for up to a third of the carbon that we produce every year. But it isn't just about putting the carbon back into soils and ecosystems and fields. It is also, like you said, about restoring coastal wetlands to protect us from storm surge. It's about restoring ecosystems to support biodiversity. It's about climate smart agriculture that is also more climate resilient as well as putting carbon back in the soil. There are these win-win-win solutions. And when you really look at all the benefits of some of these solutions for health, for the economy, for rural livelihoods, for equality, oh, and for climate too, it's the icing on the cake. The only question I have is why not? Mm -hmm. yeah. 
Yeah. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask a question. I'm gonna preface it with a shameless plug for an amazing series that the Washington Post climate team is doing this year called Unearthing the F Future, which is about paleoclimate. Uh -huh. But we don't say that because if you say paleoclimate science, many people might not read it. But instead, <laughs> it's a super exciting series uh, that some of our journalists have done, where they've gone to Crawford Lake and looked oh, at yes. you know all the impacts that humanity mm -hmm. has had since the beginning. They traveled to the Greenland ice sheet with scientists from uh, Lamont Observatory. Observatory at Columbia to you know to drill to the bedrock, and what is so fascinating about it is obviously it's kind of asking questions of the rocks and telling us you know having them tell us what the future is. And I was wondering, Dr. Hayo, if you could talk about both what you feel like the climate models say with certainty, and what's a big unanswered question that we have that right now we're really struggling to you know sort out so we can chart our future. I can. So first of all. People are often asking me these days as a climate scientist, are things changing faster than we expected? And the answer to that is actually, when we look at global average temperature, no. Where we are today is exactly where scientists predicted we would be 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. Global average temperature is right on track. We really did warn you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and when she says we, we're going back like yeah. 150 years, like well yeah. before our births. Yeah. yeah. But in terms of extremes, we have always known that we're underestimating the extremes because it's out of the tail of the distribution and things are happening that we haven't even seen before. So we always knew that we were underestimating the extremes and we're seeing that in real time today in terms of, you know, with, with the terrible floods they had in Libya, there were seven other terrible floods around the world the same week. Mm -hmm. With the heat extremes, we had terrible heat extremes here but they had massive heat waves during winter in South America at the same time. Mm -hmm. So that is where our projections have not really reached the full extent of what we're already seeing. Mm -hmm. But if you ask me what the greatest uncertainties are, there's two of them. One of them is what I alluded to before, that we've never seen things changing this fast. We've never pushed the planet this fast. And so there are feedbacks in the climate system, vicious cycles, where if we heat the planet, the Arctic starts to thaw. Mm -hmm. If the Arctic starts to thaw, all the organic material that's frozen in the ground there starts to decompose. As it decomposes, what does it produce? It produces heat-trapping gases, more of them. Mm -hmm. So the, ha, the question of how is the planet going to respond to this massive kick we're giving it that is bigger than anything we can ever see is a very concerning question to climate scientists that does keep us up at night. But the second question, what's going to happen in the future? The answer to that has a lot more to do with us than it does with the planet. We're the ones driving this change, and the choices we make today and in the near future will literally set the course for our future. And, and so the ones we make today yes. are even more important than the ones we make tomorrow, because yeah. like, it will be a very different world in five years if we don't do everything we're supposed to do this year, um, and are sort of like... If, if you're thinking, do I take t a two-year sabbatical from climate action now, yeah. or do I take a two-year sabbatical in 10 years? Like, please take it later, because the work that you do now um, will be much more transformational. I mean, take naps and whatever, but like. And there you go. And breaks. Keep uh, it going. Yeah. And actually, in the context of what you just said, you know, obviously in the internet, in the global climate debate, we often talk about like targets and timetables. And, you know, and one of the questions is, is that the right way to communicate climate change? And or is there a different language we should be using? Or is that the most relevant given yeah. the time, you know, the time sensitive you just talked it's about. It's so interesting because I feel like, well, one, I think there's no one right way to communicate about climate. Some mm -hmm. people will, you know, different messages will dif resonate with different audiences. So I think the more climate communication we have, almost the better. So great that, you know, you've been doing this work for, in a very deep way for a long time, but now, you know, every paper that of, of, you know, of note has a significant climate team, which is wonderful. And I think this sort of like timelines, deadlines, we all kind of like can relate to a deadline of for like a homework assignment, right? Like this is a group project that we are failing. <laughs> like as the kid who like did all of the work for every group project, I have like a specific sort of anxiety yeah. that's like, yeah. oh, it's yeah. on me again, you know? Um, and so I think um, I had kind of expected the, the, the United Nations uh, IPCC report on like 1.5 degrees mm -hmm. of warming um, Celsius and what that would mean um, in reality. I kind of thought like 
no one would get excited by that, mm -hmm. but that became mm -hmm. a rallying cry. Mm -hmm. Like we have this deadline for when we have mm -hmm. to like dramatically reduce um, greenhouse gas emissions. And suddenly people are like, oh, mm -hmm. there's a right. deadline and there's a percent reduction and we need to get behind this. And I just never thought I'd hear people chanting like 1.5 to stay alive mm -hmm. or we have 12 years, you know? Yeah. Um, so. I guess I'm not very good at predicting what will become chance at climate marches right. and how that will relate to scientific publications. So um, it kind of depends, I guess. I, I think you're right. I mean, as humans, we need deadlines. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, what do you do if you want to accomplish something? You set a goal, right? And then you figure out how to accomplish that goal. That's the way we work. But the challenge is, is that one and a half degrees is not a magic number. In other words, if we end up at 1.4999, it doesn't mean that we're fine. And if we end up at 1.5111, it doesn't mean it's all over. And so the danger I see, and I know that you see this too, is that people are, are investing too much in that. And what if we don't make one and a half? Well, you know what? That is a heck of a lot better than two. What if we actually make two? Well, you know what? We were headed for five 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And then two is a lot better than five. And so the concern is that if we invest overly in these deadlines and we don't make them, then people are like, oh, well, it doesn't matter. And what that one and a half degree report from the IPCC actually concluded is very powerful. The conclusion of the whole report comparing what a world would look like if we reached one and a half, if we reached two, or if we did nothing was this. Every bit of warming matters. Mm -hmm. Every action matters. Every choice matters. That was the conclusion of the science. Well, this has been an illuminating conversation, which has had more laughter than I would have predicted <laughs> for a, a serious climate science discussion. Yes. So thank you, Dr. Johnson. Thank you, Come Dr. Come hang out with us. We're not this. awful. Exactly. <laughs> um, uh, up next, we will hear from my colleague, Francis Stead Sellers, after this video. that because my generation and the generation following, because I'm old and elder, um, uh, we haven't done what we should do. do. And now young people feel, um, you know, they're, they're speaking out, the children with their Fridays for Future are speaking out, but they can't change things. And yet they know, they've read the science and they're championing it. And they're saying, you know, you have to take your responsibility because otherwise we're going to have an unlivable world. I've lost a 19-year-old cousin a seven-year-old cousin, both my grandparents to polluted water, to greed and destruction. I want the world leaders to know that the earth has a memory and all of her beloveds that she keeps tucked in her landscapes have birthed guardians they are sitting among me. You will have to answer to her children and their children and your children. And one day it will be your home, your family, your land. I pray and I hope you make the right choice. If there is one thing for those of you in the room that I want you to deliver to the rest of the world, it is that you cannot negotiate with nature. Maybe you could start by 
telling us a little bit about what I think is called planetary guardians. Sure. Um, I can start and then I'd ask Mary to fill in the blanks because I think she probably has a better understanding than even I do. So the planetary guardians is an initiative formed to promote the planetary boundaries. Uh, these boundaries are scientific-based targets that uh, have been being worked towards for the past 15 years. And uh, these boundaries are split into seven different categories. One is around climate change, another is just uh, gas emissions, another is biodiversity. And the essential idea is that these boundaries must be maintained so we don't cross the threshold of the tipping points. And the really wonderful uh, part of the boundaries is that once we exceed these boundaries, there still are mechanisms to go back and prevent the, the uh, unchangeable, um, which are the tipping points. And the Planetary Guardians is an, is an uh, effort to merge the science with the leaders who are working with civil society, with um, their constituencies, and really make sure that uh, the, what is said in the science also reaches a far, far um, wider audience. So, Mary, do pick up on that if you can. You're also involved in leading the elders at the moment. And how does this new group learn from a group like the elders? Maybe you can tell us a little bit about how that works. Ah, sorry. Ah. How does that uh, new group learn from, how does, from the elders, build upon its message, and move ahead? Well, I think um, Aisha has given a very good um, yeah. explanation. Um, I've actually been following the work on the planetary boundaries since 2018, when Johan Rost Rockström came to a group of the B team of business leaders that I belong to. I'm not a businesswoman. I have a, a moral conscience for these business leaders. <laughs> <laughs> I'm quite depressed about it somehow. <laughs> but I've since learned how valuable this is and how important it is for our world, because now uh, they've managed to get to the stage where they can do an annual health <laughs> looked at the planetary boundaries. Um, the last time before um, the, the recent report released last week, um, uh, we had exceeded four of the nine planetary boundaries. Now we have exceeded six. So we are in, you know, uh, a worrying stage with six of the planetary boundaries that keep our world in balance. And what I like about the planetary boundaries approach mm -hmm. is um, it's an explanation for people of why we're seeing these terrible floods, like mm -hmm. in Pakistan and in Libya, right. um, why we're seeing wildfires all over the world. And I've been aware, because I work on climate justice, as you heard, um, that, of course, that affected the poorest countries first right. and foremost, and they were not responsible. And, but now it's affecting everyone, and people don't understand. And the Arctic is, is worrying, and the yeah. Antarctic is worrying. And you know, we're, hit, we're hit by this every day. What's happening? This explains the interconnectedness. Right. And it means that we have to see ourselves as nature, not separate from nature. We are nature. We are part of nature. We're part of nature, and we've been yeah. losing our... Yeah. And Humility is part of that. Exactly. And, and the guardian, uh, the um, elders have been working on the climate and nature crisis. Mm. We also work on the pandemics crisis and the right. nuclear weapons crisis. So much but, in common. Yeah. And we, we have a lot in common. And actually, I have a fellow elder as um, a guardian, Juan Manuel Santos. Mm. And he tells a wonderful story about uh, his link with his indigenous peoples in his country when he became president and learning from their wisdom. And we have several indigenous uh, members of our of our group, and uh, I, I feel it, it, it's really going to be a wonderful tool that has already been used by some countries. Right. And um, the first country to decide on using the planetary boundaries was New Zealand, under Jacinda Does Ardern. It? Takes Another a woman leader. Woman leader. Takes right. There we leader. go. And then, and then. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And then Finland and Sweden and the Netherlands. Right. And um, actually. I was very pleased. I'm, I'm involved as chair of the elders in a working group on Ukraine, mm. looking at the terrible extent of the environmental damage, including the dam that was ex mm. exploded. Right. Um, the accountability for it, which of course is Russia, Putin, mm. 
and also how to build back green. You see the terrible destruction of this war. How to build how back to green. How to take back. And, and we're going to use okay. the planetary boundaries framework um, as a starting point. So, Aisha, you're 24. I hope you don't mind me telling everybody here that. But, but you, we, you need we, to mention my age. No? <laughs> <laughs> Don't leave that, or we'll, we'll whisper it. <laughs> um, and now that we've said it, everybody's going to know it 40 years from now. <laughs> we've been talking about worry. Hmm. Your generation has had to embrace a sense of worry that I don't think either of us had hmm. when we were 24. Yeah. Can you talk about that and what it means? Yeah. Um, how I how I describe this worry is um, how many people in the room have experienced anxiety that they cannot explain or depression that they cannot let's explain. Let's go around the room. Yeah. Um, what modern day physics classifies as matter that cannot uh, matter as energy cannot be uh, destroyed or uh, created is what we're feeling. And the analysis I have for that is, um, as a species, we are destroying nature at such a mass speed. And we are harming nature at such a mass speed. This nature is matter, it has energy. Mm. And these random waves of anxiety is what we feel when a mother whale loses her child and she's calling out for help. Um, this anxiety that our children are experiencing, that the younger generation is experiencing, is because children are closer to the beginning of life. They're able to have a wisdom that allows them to connect to what is happening in the world around us. And that is why it is so nerve-wracking, but that is why they're also petitioning for a truth. It is. Um, it, it is so bluntly obvious. There isn't any other solution. So Mary, we hear those very, very powerful mm. words. In the time that you've been involved, and we saw the hand up over there cheering for women, women's leadership has changed dramatically. What do you think it means for addressing the kinds of vulnerabilities that, uh, with mothers and mm. small children mm. that Aisha is talking mm. about? It's a very interesting question, and I'm very aware of the anxieties and the pressures on young leaders like Aisha. Mm -hmm. I was with Natasha Nakate at breakfast mm -hmm. this morning with women leaders, mm -hmm. and she spoke about you know, her you know, trying to create awareness, but also trying to put um, solar panels and clean cooking into schools in Uganda. No real support. Right. You know, and if you, you know, if you want to make it an application, the, the paperwork you have to go through, and you know, it was it was really, mm. uh, you know, very moving to, to listen to her. Um, women leaders need to step up now as never before. And the interesting thing is, do you uh, think they're not? Um, they are. Well, they they have to st st um, s step up on climate, right? The okay. climate and nature crisis. What a, what and an what we're finding is that um, there are very many women leaders who do extraordinary work right. on health issues, on violence against women, on girls' education, right. on Me Too issues, yeah. all of them. But say um, climate is not my thing. Mm. Actually, nobody can say that now. We're guardians of planetary boundaries. Climate is everyone's thing. We all actually need to become guardians and feel that connection with nature. And you know, absolutely all of us. And women leaders um, lead in a different way which mm. the world needs. Mm. I'm, I'm very in favor, it's not excluding men, it's having that balance. Um, uh, you know, if you have um, a balanced cabinet, it's better for the country, it's better right. for the um, climate policies in that country, it's better for girls' education, everything. Um, so. Um, uh, what we need now is much more evidence of women um, understanding that we are in a crisis. As, as Greta Thunberg put it so well, our house is burning. So women need to step We in. have an audience here who agrees we're in a crisis, mm. but not everybody does, mm. Aisha. And you have to convey a message. How do you avoid being dismissed as you know, the younger generation that gets caught up in, you know, protests and movements mm. and is shrill and will kind of grow out of this? Um, it's the nature of the crisis. It, we're not going to grow out of it. It's just going to get worse. 
and we're going to get more activated, but what we're leaving uh, younger generations with is even more work. Um, but on your point of, uh, there's people in the room who, who agree, but then there's a uh, very large constituency that doesn't. And I think uh, to answer that question, we need to see wins. So in the United States, the Dakota Access Pipeline was shut down by conservative white ranchers and indigenous people who worked together because they understood that clean water and clean air and land is everybody's fundamental human right. And my, you know, when, when speaking to someone who doesn't agree with me, it's, it's as simple as this. If your tap water tomorrow started coming out dirty, and if you went to the grocery store and you did not have food, you would fight the people making your water dirty and taking your food as well. It's not just indigenous people. Mm -hmm. Our direct access to water is through our rivers. Mm -hmm. Is our direct access to our food is through our soil. That is why we can immediately see it. That's why we immediately are fighting for its protection. But in a developed country like this, and we saw it during the COVID pandemic, when people ran out of toilet paper, the, like it, th there were protests and like movement around it. Um, but it's you know it, the 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 part about uh, a doomism culture mm -hmm. and the part about how uh, young people have this negative mindset or, or it's insinuated that we have a negative mindset. Um, doomism comes for from a place of feeling like there is no way out. Mm -hmm. And when when someone like me is called a leader, it's quite it's quite. Uh, destabilizing because for a long time I felt like myself and my peers were hand in hand walking in a dark cave with lanterns in our hand but there was no light in front there's nothing to see and we have to carry that light and, in, and, and hope for the rest but wouldn't it be so beautiful if we could pass it along and so that future generations that are to come they have, a, the light. they have a light to, have to, a light. to go towards. Oh, whoops. Don't cry. We have oh. to take care. OK. <laughs> that was very dramatic. And I don't know. Um, I made my point. Powerfully. <laughs> 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 you. let's just leave, leave the first OK. Um, policy making and activism, you've seen both. And you, you hear that. Hmm. incredibly powerful message about you know finding the light seeing the light at yeah. the end of that tunnel <coughs> which works better do they need to work together how do you see those two things um, potentially working together to reach the light that Aisha is talking about well the, the interesting thing is we are on the cusp of a clean energy healthier safer mm -hmm. climate world we're on the cusp of it mm -hmm. but we're moving too slowly and the science planetary boundaries are hurting and they're right. hurting seriously and we need to move with much more urgency we need a sense of crisis and uh, you might notice that we're both wearing dandelions I loved your dandelions yeah. you told me just tell quickly a little about yeah. a very and important a, a number symbol. of women leaders called connected women leaders right. have started to use the dandelion as a feminist icon symbol right. earth shot symbol right. of urgency for a climate justice broad movement to connect mm. all the work that's being done by young people, by indigenous communities, mm. by progressive business, etc. But we also want to reach those women who don't prioritize climate. That climate mm. is not my thing. Mm. Climate is everybody's thing now, as I've been saying. So um, <clears throat> we, we feel the reason that the dandelion is such a wonderful symbol is it grows on all seven continents. It's very resilient. You can't get rid of the damn thing if you want to. Um, <laughs> it's very regenerative. It's got long roots. Um, you can eat every part of it or drink every part of it. You can have it in teas and in wine, oh. etc. Um, uh, and even the roots take toxins out of the human body. So uh, how do you spread it? It's a light touch connector. See, if we, um, the, the reason we're not moving quick enough is, right. is twofold. One. It's the enormous communications on the dark side, as oh. I call it, the fossil fuel oh. side. Oh. Mm -hmm. uh, four billion a year. Muddying the science, 
prolonging fossil fuel indefinitely to fight poverty, all this kind of stuff, and paying lip service to clean energy, but not actually right. really investing. Um, so we need to switch out of what's harming us into that clean energy. But d democracies find it difficult, and that's a, point, a vital point I want to make, because right. I know it. I know, for example, my own country, Ireland, right. um, we have good climate policy. We have a target of reducing by 51% our emissions by 2030. Despite lots of effort, we're only on course for 29% reduction. But we're doing a lot better than the United States. Um, <laughs> the Inflation Reduction Act is incentivizing clean energy. That's very good, but it's one out of three. You are not cutting your emissions here in the United States. Um, you are actually extending. Right. And, sec and secondly, you're not giving the climate finance you should be to the poorest countries to help them to develop. So I have a question for Aisha about that. Yes. And, and that is the kind of all or nothing approach that we yeah. hear among climate activists. Yeah. The Inflation Reduction Act yeah. wasn't all it could be, but it was mm. arguably better than nothing. How do you address that, that notion out there that, uh, and we had some of it yesterday from the streets of New York, we need everything now. Yeah. How do we get there? Um, so the nuclear bomb was developed in a matter of four years mm -hmm. in, with, the, with the Manhattan Project, mm -hmm. when the United States felt and, and Europe felt the urgency from Russia to develop a weapon of such mass destruction. It's possible. If we really think of this as a crisis, it's possible to get our act together. Now, I do want to mention that we do have planetary boundaries that we can recede back from, but we have six years before we reach 1.5 degrees Celsius. And I know before earlier, uh, Dr. Hayhoe was mentioning that it's not uh, about 1.5.11 or 1.499, but if we exceed far too much, a country like mine is done. Cultures are done, entire people are go extinct. And that is why it's necessary to do it both with urgency and then also understand the temporality. Because we are only here for a limited period of time. The, we are leaving a planet uh, that is going to be uninhabitable for generations to come after us. And last point, I was uh, heavily involved in the march yesterday in the organizing so yep. in the organizing of it. This is the first time that in the United States citizens came together and said it's the end of fossil fuels. Before ten years ago, policymakers were afraid to even say the word. You know, the Paris Climate Agreement, and I know um, President Robinson was there for for a lot of the developments of these things. They don't even have the words oil, mm -hmm. gas, yeah. or fossil fuel mm -hmm. in international policy. Mm -hmm. So to, to, to really solve this crisis, we need to be honest. And at the policy level, we are not being honest. So the political level also, uh, there's huge partisanship around this mm. topic, particularly in this country. Is yeah. there anywhere else like it in the world, Mary, where... I don't know, think there's any other country where um, the divide is so bad. And right. it's kind of really um, uh, getting worse uh, right. because it's, uh, it, it's becoming s tied in with other political divides. Um, uh, you know, um, it, it's worrying to see um, you know, what, what is happening um, in uh, what should be bringing us together. And that's why, in many ways, um, uh, I think we can look to women leaders. I mean, Catherine Hayhoe, whom I know very well, is doing great work in Texas, um, you know, um, talking to people um, who... Reaching out to groups. Reaching who, out to groups right. who don't want to talk about climate, and but, about see, but see a reality, and, right. see the flooding, see the storms, see the... And, right. and the cost, you know, we need to talk more about the cost of not paying attention to climate, and especially the human cost, mm. the cost in deaths, the cost in disease, the cost in health, even the cost of the air pollution of fossil fuels, seven million a year, um, dying prematurely because of that. Um, so uh, we need to, you know, the, the way of talking about it is, you know, factor in the externalities. Mm. Um, and uh, more than anything else, we need the kind of voice that Aisha's um, expressing here to 
the political leaders to get that sense of urgency. That's what we need. It's the urgency of now. And unless we can gather our strengths, um, make more visible all the efforts that are being made at local level um, to um, make communities resilient. You know, I hear all the time wonderful stories. That's all underfunded. Yeah. And we need to shift the funding mm. to pay more um, for what women and young people and particularly indigenous communities are doing to help to protect the forest, to save the land, to, you know, to make the communities resilient, etc. And um, we need to bring that voice of urgency to democratic leaders to take the hard decisions now. Um, there are actually some of them going backwards. The G20 was weaker this year than last year. The stock take about the conference on climate showed that although all countries are supposed to make their efforts under their nationally determined contributions, none of them have made enough effort, and the most responsible are the worst almost. Which brings me to a last question. We've heard from extraordinary women all afternoon, and you two also re represent leadership for your own generations. So Mary, if you have a message for the women of Aisha's generation in a sentence or two to meet the challenges we've been talking about all day, what would it be? I'm really impressed in a lot of intergenerational conversation, which I've also had with Aisha um, this afternoon, uh, at the knowledge and the um, awareness and the social connections of young people. The problem is they're not getting the support. Um, so, um, you know, I think we need to support much more, not say, oh, I'm so impressed by these young leaders. Right. Uh, words Let's like that aren't, aren't enough. Um, it's actual support that's needed. What do you need? The same question, but what do you need from Mary's generation that can help you forge ahead in this huge challenge? The funding exists to solve the climate crisis. The resources exist to solve the climate crisis. And from Mary as an individual, I, I am not the arbitrator on this, but she is fulfilling her responsibility. It's not, and, and you know, I don't even blame my parents in particular because they did not cause the climate crisis. I come from a very rural community in Pakistan. But it's not just Mary's generation or just elder generations. The elder generations need to put pressure on businesses yeah. and governments. See, with the climate crisis, there are people causing it who have names and addresses. And we need to be brave enough to call them out. Yeah. We need to be brave enough to call them out. Thank you, Aisha Siddiqui <laughs> and Mary Robinson, for such powerful, powerful <laughs> conversations this afternoon. Everybody knows that there's a reception outside, so please join us there. And thank you very much for joining us today. Okay, watch, watch your feet. Yeah. yeah. I